Welcome to Power Talks with Santosh Shah. With this highlight episode, we complete the season two of Power Talks. The Ambassador of Malaysia to Nepal, His Excellency Dato Ilan Kovan Kolandavelu. Malaysia has become an influential nation in Asia today with its unique approach of economy and prosperity and fraternity. Sakyamuni Buddhist Foundation of Malaysia, and with your leadership as well, mm -hmm. uh, you have been pushing for the last two years with the Nepal government to develop Lumini as a peace city, to invite millions of Buddhists from yeah. the world over. Yeah. Uh, it's a three billion US dollar project. That's right. Uh, how is it that project moving on? Well, uh, Sakyamuni Buddhist Foundation Malaysia uh, is founded by a group of uh, Malaysian Chinese who are Buddhists themselves. And they, together with AirAsia as a strategic partner, are very keen to develop Lumpini into an international peace city. Because if you look at other religions, other major religions, they all have developed their sacred cities. You know. So Lumpini is one place, uh, which is the birthplace of Buddha, has not been developed. You know. There are about 150 million Buddhists within one to five hours flying time around, over around, Asia. around Asia. You know. Of course, there are 380 million Buddhists throughout the world. But in Asia alone, within one to five hours flying time, there are 150 million Buddhists. So just imagine, if you can bring in uh, about 10% of that population annually, it's already 50 million people. So we are looking at Lumpini as a wholesale development. It's a package development. We are talking of clusters. We are talking of uh, not only hotels, you know, hotels from uh, budget hotels to three star, four star, five star, and also other facilities, you know, power, water, utilities, other utilities, and also uh, uh, the, uh, education institutions, which is related to Buddhism, and also uh, hospitals, because I, I was told that uh, many Buddhists would like, have to, would, would like to have their children born in, uh, in Lumpini because the birthplace of Buddha is very significant. The Lumpini Peace Project can actually change the face of the country. That's right. Yes. It's a huge project, $3 mm -hmm. billion dollar investments with prospects of having 400 million Buddhists pilgrims visit Lumpini. Why does not our leaders, the, the leaders in the Nepal government, Get it, get the simple theory. I really do not know, Santosh. Over the almost a year, I've approached various levels of government, including the previous Prime Minister, you know. But somehow, I do not know, you know, we did not get any response at all. Probably the previous government was a caretaker government for almost seven months. And also they were embroiled with their own uh, political problems, you know. Uh, so probably that's the reason. But now, I'm making my attempts to see the, the, the current Prime Minister, you know. I think, uh, in Nepal, there's enough of political revolution, you know, uh, over a long history, political history. I think Nepal uh, should now move into economic revolution. So I think we should probably, Lumpini is, is the right project, you know, to, to start off. Because uh, Nepal is graced with the birthplace of Buddha, uh, Lumpini. That will always stay like yeah, that. It will stay like that, as you say. And uh, I think the Takimuni Buddhist Foundation, Air Asia, uh, has indicated to me Getting the funds, international fund, is not a problem, you know. But of course, uh, the ball is in Nepal's court, you know, in the Nepal government's court. You know. Mr. Rajesh Samal, Nepal's most celebrated movie star. Rajesh Samal has acted in more than 250 films during the 25 years of golden times of Nepali cinema. One of the reasons why young people are entering into criminal gangs and, and causing havoc in the country is the increasing lawlessness in the, in the entire country. Uh, as a result, people suffer a lot. I mean, normally, the people who cause this havoc, this, this, they create troubles for the common people, are portrayed as villains in your films. And uh, normally, you just beat them up and kill them in two and a half hours and give justice to the people. In reality, we know that does not happen. But in case if it happens, how long time does it take for people to get justice? That's how I think film and the reality differs. Because in a film, you can have this um, Messiah coming out, you know, Superman. Guy, Superman coming out, and he says that, okay, I'll take care of everything, don't you worry, and he eventually does. Uh, but in real life, uh, you cannot put all your uh, eggs in, in one basket and think that this um, one single factor will be the determined uh, uh, factor to, to make things work in the society. I think it has to be a contribution coming in from all sections of the society, the youth, uh, the, 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 older, the experiences of the older generation, the vigor of the youth, and uh, people working in different uh, uh, platforms and you know, in a different uh, workforces. And they all have to contribute in their own way, and that is how you make a sustainable and a strong uh, nation and society. But 
unfortunately, in a country like ours, we are so now uh, uh, politically unstable and economically lacking behind in terms of, you know, like we're in a 21st century where all, most of the countries are making progress by leaps and bounds, and we're sort of like still struggling with our politics, still struggling with uh, the law of the country to be yet to be written. Writing the new constitution could be the beginning of the solution of all these issues that we touched upon. But do you think we will get the new constitution drafted by the end of May? It looks very bleak the way that things are going right now because, you know, though it has become very cliche to say consensus, you know, we should all get together and, you know, reach a sort of a compromise. Um, we're saying all this, but this, that's the only way out, no matter how cliche or mundane it sounds or how repetitive it sounds, that is the only way. It's only through consensus by compromising on a certain situation that we're going to have a law of this country because, as you know, there are political parties with you know, a political ideology that differs so much from one another. So if they all stick to their own political ideology and do not want to bulge in, then there is no way that you can have a common constitution that appeals to all the uh, spheres uh, of, of the population. Uh, so I feel, uh, and, and, and the way things are going right now, I do not see any uh, consensus happening because it's not only inter-party uh, disturbances that they're having. It's also the inter-party things that they're going through. And uh, no matter how uh, sad or, or unencouraging it looks, it is the fact that we do not have a leader who is actually thinking about the entire nation and the entire population. They all have their vested interests. His Excellency Hong Sung Mok, the Ambassador of Republic of Korea to Nepal. The achievements of Korea in the sectors of technology, security, economy, and culture is known to the world. Korea's power and influence in the Asian region is gradually becoming indispensable. With the economic growth of Korea, it has become a leading country in terms of manufacturing. Uh, but the recent tsunami attack in Japan, uh, which is a matter of sadness for the whole world, it seems that it has placed Korea in an advantageous position, as the political and business uh, analysts say. How do you see this uh, situation as a tragedy or as a matter of uh, advantage to your country? Let me tell you what I was told when I was in Europe. I spent over 10 years of my life in Europe. Uh, in Europe, they fondly say when Germany catches cold, neighboring countries uh, will cough. I think uh, the same applies to Japan and Korea. If Japan catches cold, uh, Korea cannot avoid uh, coughing. Um, in the traditional agricultural society, sometimes uh, one man's uh, meat is uh, another man's poison. But in industrial society, everything is interconnected. For example, if a big company in Japan closed down, then uh, component suppliers uh, in Korea will have to close down, and vice versa. They are all uh, interconnected. National, there is a national boundary, but in economy, we don't have that kind of national boundary. So I would uh, say Japan's uh, difficulty is uh, Korea's difficulty as well. So I really hope Japan will come back to normal as soon as possible. Korea and Nepal have something in common in terms of geographical location. Uh, Korea is situated among some power nations such as China, Japan, and Russia. But the way Korea has maintained its sovereignty and uh, economy is pretty amazing. How can Nepal learn from Korea's examples in terms of positioning itself in between China and India? Until pretty recently, uh, there was some um, animosity between Korea on one side, I mean South Korea on one side, and uh, China and Russia on the other side. But now we have overcome all these things, and uh, uh, Korea is on good terms with both China and Russia. And uh, that is important. Uh, for Nepal, I would say uh, instead of uh, looking at uh, India and China as uh, uh, threats, or how should I put it, uh, big as, as, as elephants. You had better 
see it as uh, your own market. So my advice would be try to make Nepal relevant both to India and China. And that is the way for Nepal to go. His Excellency Scott H. DeLisi, the Ambassador of the United States of America to Nepal. America and Nepal are located on the opposite side of the globe, yet in just six decades, Nepal has developed a strong bond of friendship with America. Recently, you mentioned that Al-Qaeda and others have their hideouts in Nepal. Can you elaborate on that and how does your government plan to deal with this? I always like to be respectful of my host, so don't take this wrong, but that, that's not quite what I've said. We've never said Al-Qaeda has hideouts here. What we have said, and I don't think Al-Qaeda has anything to do with Nepal, there are terrorist groups, though, in the region, in South Asia, that recognize and I think that see in Nepal the potential. You've got, you've got a 1,600-kilometer open border with India. Security, as we know, and the Terai was devastated. The police presence was devastated during the insurgency. Immigration controls are lax, and there are always issues there. So as a result, there's many vulnerabilities that could be exploited by terrorists. And this is what we've spoken to, and we have said that publicly, that we are concerned that terrorist elements may seek to exploit Nepal's territory to the detriment of others in the region, and also, I would say, to the detriment of Nepal. No country wants it. mechanism which we have in the current state in Entarai is near to a collapse. The presence of government, law and order is weakening day by day. Mm. Tarai used to be a green belt for growing vegetables and food. Now they're growing cannabis and opium. Before Tarai becomes a reason of warlords like in Afghanistan, mm. can we not look into the proverb Prevention is better than cure for this neglected reason. This issue of drugs that you, that you raised, Santosh, is something that I've been hearing more and more about since I've been here as well. On my first trip to the Terai almost well, about a year ago, when I was in Beer Gunge, uh, I started to hear about it. I have heard about it as I have traveled in other parts of the Terai, and it is an issue of concern to us. It is not yet a primary focus for us, or for any donor, and nor is it for the government, but I think that we need to be looking at this much more closely, to be honest. And I've talked with a lot of young people who are working in the Terai, many of whom are trying to address this issue, and trying to get farmers to redirect their efforts and their resources, but it's also, you've got to find that combination of alternatives and enforcement of the laws as well. We're probably making progress they can move towards enforcement. We're working with the police and all the rest, you know, all the, the security, uh, security establishment. But we really do need a to do a better job still of empowering the people with alternatives. And also, though, it seems to me it's giving them a stake in their nation. People who really believe in their country, who want Nepal to believe in Nepal and want it to prosper, aren't going to want to produce drugs. His Excellency Thomas Goss, the Ambassador of Switzerland to Nepal. Switzerland is a dream destination for every tourist in the world. Switzerland is also a role model nation for many voters and electoral candidates in Nepal. Since Rana regime, even till today, we have been hearing often that people in power have stashed their money through corruption in Swiss banks. How real do you see this speculation? The whole international culture about stashing away your money has evolved a lot in the, in the last 10 to 15 years. Especially the OECD has placed a lot of pressure on certain jurisdictions to, to uh, be more cooperative in terms of information about, about uh, money in the banks. Now, for Switzerland, 
banking is a really important uh, economic uh, area, an important economic sector. And so for us, the privacy of the information the privacy of the data that is related to the banking is really important. That is protected by our civil code and basically the information about the money that you may have in our banks, that information belongs to you. It doesn't even belong to the owner of the bank. It doesn't belong to the state, to any state. Uh, under certain conditions, of course, that information could be released, but uh, it's not an information that is publicly available. Now. Of course, for big financial centers, that poses certain risks, and uh, this, uh, this privacy of the, of the banking information can be abused of, and can, uh, can be abused of in crime and in, in, in money laundering. So let's say the Anti-Corruption Commission of Nepal, which is CIAA, has to probe into an investigation to figure out, to find out who has uh, put their money abroad, uh, earned through illegal means and through corruption. How will your government support this move taken by the Anti-Corruption Commission of Nepal? Switzerland is, is actually very active in the, in the fight against uh, money laundering and cross-border financial crime. Um, we are actively participating in the various international commissions that deal with that and that also establish rules and norms in that sector. This is, the, this is a must for a for a country that wants to pride itself in, in its banking sector. It has to be active and has to have, be very disciplined, putting the onus also to some extent on the banks, um, agreeing to cooperate with, with other countries around the globe if there, there is a need for uh, mutual assistance in the area of fighting crime uh, related to the movement of finances. So. Um, if there is a request, a formal request, of course, that the, those requests are, are responded to within the framework, of course, of our federal act on, on mutual assistance in crime. If you look at what happened in, in the recent past in North Africa, where a number of, um, of leaders... Yeah, the dictators. Were, a number of leaders there had, had their, their assets blocked quite quickly in, in Swiss banks, actually, before many of the other countries did so. So if Nepal's Anti-Corruption Commission has to uh, look into it, to what extent of time length can we trace back? That is difficult for me to answer now. What I could say, though, is that one of the aspects is, to, is that the onus has to come, as of course, from Nepal, that there is a, there, it's important to establish how those funds were acquired by the person. And, of course, there has to be some legal proceedings that have to take place here in Nepal before uh, Switzerland can consider or entertain any, any kind of uh, mutual assistance in this regard. His Excellency Robert Piper, the head of the United Nations in Nepal. His process, constitution drafting, army integration and citizenship issues are at deadlock and Nepal's economic growth is at halt. We are facing the most difficult phase of Nepal's modern history. At this time of political crisis or leadership crisis, United Nations can have a very important role to play. In the last three years, we have heard several versions of the peace process, constitution drafting, lots of debate. But you are a person who have been in the center among the donor agencies, international agencies, United Nations, and the government of Nepal, including several political parties. How do you review or how do you see the past, present, and future of the constitution drafting and the peace process of Nepal? I always remind any visitor who's coming to understand Nepal that the, the scale of the ambition that is going on here, and you've got to really respect that. I mean, the issues that are up for, for, for transformation that are spelled out in the peace agreement are truly profound, deep, long-term structural issues. So, so I, I think um, the first thing you've got to appreciate the time scale involved. I look back at, at the three years I've been here and I see, um, I see a lot of things to be, to, to be very optimistic about. I see a, a, a CA that is so much more representative than anything that came and before it. Uh, I see political leaders of every shade that are talking to each other constantly and of course you can criticize them for talking too much but there's a lot of 
post-conflict environments where you can't take that as a given that people, uh, those channels are remaining so open. Um, even if there is distrust, there's elements of respect and communication which are absolutely crucial for building, uh, for building peace. I see a republic declared peacefully. You know, I see a, a lot of, um, a lot of very sensitive issues that are hard, you know, closely held uh, to people's hearts in many communities. These, these things are in question, they're being changed, the discussions and assumptions are being questioned, and that is being done peacefully. And, uh, and you've got to kind of give full marks for, to the state, for the nation, if you will, for managing such sensitive issues so effectively. It, looking ahead, you know, one has to hope that, that uh, everything will continue in such a sort of positive way. Um, one also has to hope that the pace of change, of course, will accelerate. That's something that all Nepalis feel, and, and they're not alone. I think the international community wants to see uh, a, greater, a greater speed in this, in this transition. Um, but as they say, uh, I think an ex-president once said, hope is not a plan. So it's not enough just to hope that things go well and cross your fingers. But also, you know, it would be great to see a little bit more of a plan laid out, even if that plan gets changed as midway. But, uh, I have to say, the, the issues that are laid out in the peace agreement are fairly clear, but it isn't very obvious what is the strategy to get to some of these things. What's the strategy on rule of law? What's the strategy on social inclusion? And it isn't easy to find people, frankly, to talk about these issues in government. So as I look forward, I'm looking for a plan, as, if you will, to make sure that this transition ends up in the right, the right uh, end point. Honorable Nilkantho Breti, the Chief Election Commissioner of Nepal. The Election Commission is the backbone of a country's democracy. Since a century now, the people of Nepal have strived to establish democracy and have succeeded in doing so. The results of the first year of the Constitution Assembly is really noteworthy. But if we look at the second year, it, it does not meet the people's aspiration as the CA members failed to deliver the Constitution on time, and rather they even extended it two times. How long can the CA members continue extending their own tenure because they hold the voting rights? And the provision of Constitution, uh, I couldn't see any, anything except one Constituent Assembly elections in the history of Nepal. We should be able to produce the member of Constituent Assembly who should be writing Constitution for the people of this country and giving to the people. They are the representative of the people. That is what I can understand. And uh, one thing I should mention without signing away and is that we were over, overly, I should say, uh, unrealistically optimistic and ambitious as well, ambitious as well to, to set time for writing constitution. We only, we were encouraged because of the peace process we were driving on our own, who was successfully moving ahead, and uh, we were excited. And we thought that two years will be more than sufficient to write new constitution in the environment we were in. And that was, I think, overrealist, unrealistic, and uh, that may have had uh, uh, the problem in thinking of the time frame for writing constitution in the first place. So the extension of the uh, CA, for um, until uh, the new constitution comes. It is uh, completely the uh, right of the CA members and also the provision of the constitution if constitution gives you to extend and continue uh, for um, indefinite period, it may be. The people are getting impatient and they're getting very frustrated. There is a lot of anger mounting in the general population of the country. And if there is a third extension, I fear that people may resort to streets, uh, maybe even in a violent way. But in that scenario, uh, cannot any permanent body in the governance, like the President's office or the Supreme Court, or your office, the Election Commission itself, intervene before that happens and, and prevent a huge catastrophe? Let me tell about my commission. The Election Commission of Nepal doesn't possess the prerogative of taking uh, or intervening the situation. We are responsible constitutional body for making credible elections in this country. We are ready for that. Any election that comes tomorrow, we are preparing for that. With regards to 
objecting or intervening in the process of writing constitution by some other constitutional body, it is, I think, not my area of comments. I, I should not be speaking on that particularly because I, being a head of constitutional body of uh, the constitutions, and I have my own restrictions, so as Santos Babu, I cannot say whether it has to be you know, led to that direction or we have to wait until uh, we write a new constitution and extend the time frame of the uh, CA. We had a short and a wonderful journey during the last two months. We'll be back soon with the season three of Power Talks. Until then, good luck, goodbye, and have a great life.